JT Barrett was a star quarterback at the college level for many years. Or was he? Some do make the argument and try to say he is one of the best quarterbacks to ever play at Ohio State. On the other hand, there's a lot of people who don't know what to make out of his career. As great as he looked at times, it almost feels like he didn't do quite enough. He couldn't get over that hump and he struggled to solidify his legacy. JT Barrett has one of the most peculiar football careers from high school to finish that I've ever seen. It had a lot of ups and downs, from being a four-star recruit in high school to being named the starter at Ohio State to then getting benched and he also got arrested. Yes, that's right, you heard me correctly. He did get arrested. A lot of people don't know that. We'll touch on it later in the video. You would think somebody who was 38-6 and six as a starting quarterback at the college level would at least have a job in the NFL. Maybe not a starter, but at least a backup or third string quarterback. And if he didn't have a job in the NFL, you would say, hey, maybe he's got a career in the Canadian League or somewhere else. Despite all of his great accomplishments at Ohio State and what he's done ever since he was in high school, he doesn't even have a job. There's many different things that play into this and why he's not where he'd like to be today. Is it because of the decisions he made on the field or off the field? I think it goes without being said, we have a lot to look into and a lot to digest in this video, so therefore it leaves us with the main question today. What really happened to JT Barrett? What's good y'all, hope you're having a blessed day. Hey, hit that subscribe button and leave a like for more. Let's get into the story. JT Barrett. I don't know if I've ever seen a situation quite like this. You got a guy who puts up legendary numbers, legendary stats, breaks a ton of records, and goes 38 and 6 as a starter. He was always in the Heisman Trophy conversation, and I saw everywhere that people were saying if he would have won one to two or three more games, he might have been a college football legend. Is he a college football legend? No. When you talk about the legends, nobody's going to bring up his name. However, what's so ironic about it, he almost fits the mold of a legend. And what I mean by that is he had the stats to back it up. And what's even more surreal about it, and it's mind boggling to think about, at least for me when I was doing all my research, if he would have won two to three and maybe four more games, he would be literally on the hinges of being one of the best college quarterbacks of all time. I try not to go into that too much because in life we could play the what if game about everything. JT was extremely close to being on that legend category and legend status. With all that being said, he had a couple of slip ups here and there that ultimately was a detriment to his entire life and career. Whoa, 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 hold on right there. We're getting ahead of ourselves. You already know. To get into JT's story, we gotta throw it all the way back to where things started. JT attended and started his high school football career in Texas. Growing up, he was a three-sport athlete playing football, basketball, and track. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about his basketball and track career due to the reasons this is a football video. I do wanna throw in there, he was really good at both of them and he could've went D1 in either of those. As a football player, he didn't see meaningful time up until his junior year of high school when he completely went off. Growing up, I remember the NCAA football games from NCAA 12 to 14, where you could, they had this mode where you could pick a Heisman Trophy winner and I would always pick Robert Griffin III and you could play that season like you're trying to win the Heisman. It wasn't the road to glory, it was this Heisman campaign. If you played it, you know what I'm talking about. I brought that up because when I would use RG3, I would always try to pass for a lot of yards and rush for over a couple thousand in one year. While I thought it was hard to do that in a video game, JT Barrett was doing it in high school. He rushed for over 1,500 yards and passed for over 1,600 as a junior and had 23 touchdowns. I'm going to say those numbers again. They deserve to get more recognition. He rushed for over 1,500 and passed for over 1,500. Wow. He basically was just like, you know what? I feel like scrambling. I'm going to scramble sometimes. And I'm also going to throw sometimes. Whatever I feel like doing. I brought up the video game reference because I want you to understand that's how easy it looked out there for him when I was watching film. You know how when you're playing a sports game and you're dominating your competition, you don't really pay attention to the plays and you kind of relax and do whatever you want and it still works? That's how it looked for JT in high school. It didn't matter who they were playing he was gonna have a field day. It's hard for me to come to the terms that he did that and put up those ridiculous numbers as a junior. Our story enters a rough patch here, 
In his senior season, he tore his ACL and missed almost the entire season. He did get to play in a few games where in total he rushed for over 550 yards and he passed for almost 800. Anytime you see a high school athlete, and a great one at that, have a injury like this where they miss their entire senior season, it's devastating. You don't wish a season ending injury, especially your senior season, on nobody. As bad as it was, JT Barrett, he had two decisions. He could feel bad for himself and get down on himself, or he could say, hey, tough things happen in life, I gotta fight through it. JT said, you know what, it's difficult, it's sad, but I got a career ahead of me. I gotta go to rehab and put in the work, so I'm ready for college. Thankfully, by his senior year, when he got hurt, he was already established as one of the top quarterbacks in the country, and he was listed as a four-star recruit. If he didn't get hurt, I feel like easily he would have been a five-star. You know how it goes. Every college in the country, they wanted this man. But in 2012, in April, he decided to commit and sign with Ohio State. I see a lot of scenarios of these four- and five-star recruits go to big-time colleges where Maybe it's not a good fit, but hey, they just want to go there because they're the best. When JT decided to go to Ohio State, I didn't think that at all. I thought it was the perfect fit. When you think of an Ohio State quarterback, what does everybody in the country think of? A dual threat quarterback that can run and scramble. That's just the Ohio State meta when you think of them and their quarterback play. Now JT's career started off with bad luck for somebody else, but good luck for him. The starting quarterback at the time, Braxton Miller, got hurt, and he was the backup, so he was now the starter. In 2014, for a freshman, he had a fine year, and you could argue that he was one of the best quarterbacks in his conference. He completed 64.7% of his passes, threw for 2,800 yards, had 34 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. On the ground in that same year, he had 938 yards with 11 touchdowns. So in total, 44 touchdowns for a freshman? Not too bad. Maybe a concern here or there is the interceptions. Hey, he's a freshman. It's going to happen. One key piece to this 2014 year, many of you might recall, this is the last time Ohio State won the national championship. However, JT Barrett did not lead them to the championship. He got hurt in the final game of the season. This was the same year that Ohio State snuck into the playoff spot. They got in at number four. They played Alabama, upset them, and then they won the championship behind Cardell Jones. Speaking of Cardell Jones, that man has fallen off the face of the earth. We might have to do a story on him later in this year. So yes, JT had a good year, and he led them somewhat to the end of the year, but he didn't cap it off himself. Cardell did all of that. I honestly feel like if JT was the starting quarterback and he never got hurt, they wouldn't have beat Alabama and they wouldn't have won the championship, but hey, that's a different conversation for a different day. Not taking anything away from Cardell Jones, what he did, it was magnificent and it was cool to see. The thing with Alabama, they didn't have the scouting report on him and nobody in the rest of that year knew what to expect out of Cardell Jones. They thought it was a fluke. Here's the main difference. With JT, you had 10 to 11 games of film you could study. What Cardell, there was none. So if you're a defensive coordinator, how do you prepare your defense? You see what I'm saying? It's harder to prepare for a backup sometimes than a starter. Regardless, Ohio State won the championship. Kudos to them. They deserved it. They played the best at the end of the year. And also they had Ezekiel Elliott, who was a monster. Going into 2015, we had a really odd situation at our hands. We had the previous third string quarterback going up against the previous second string quarterback for the now starting job. To make a long story short, Cardell Jones would beat out JT Barrett, in my opinion, this was the right move at the time. Cardell proved against Alabama, and I believe they played Oregon that year in the championship and the Big Ten championship, that he could win the big time games. There was also this argument that JT was more of a proven quarterback and the safe quarterback. Here's my thing. Yes, JT was the safer option, but he wasn't going to lead you to the promised land like Cardell was. Was Cardell a big risk? Yes, but High risk, high reward. That's how I look at it. Overall, for the 2015 year for Ohio State, it was a odd case at the quarterback position because they was trying this system where they would both put in Cardell and JT and try to play them the same amount of times and give them the same amount of reps. In 2015, he only started five of those games and his overall record was 4-1. and one. one thing to note too, early in that year, on August 31st, JT Barrett was arrested for a quote-unquote DUI. It wasn't a major deal at the time, it was only a $400 fine and his license did get suspended for 180 days. The team did suspend him for its next game on November 7th against Minnesota. I get it 100%. College
college kids and even grown people, they're going to make bad decisions in their life. But JT Barrett, come on, my man. You're the starting quarterback for Ohio State, the Ohio State. You're held to a different standard. You just simply can't afford to make dumb decisions like that. There's no excuse. Oh yeah, I can't forget to mention to bring up, this was in the midst of the quarterback battle. You're trying to win the job. Moving on, throughout the year, Yes, Ohio State was winning their games, however, you'd get this weird feeling watching them that something wasn't right. I'm going to throw this screenshot on the screen right now, just take a look at it. On the far right, you see the stat of who is the higher passer for the game. In almost every game, it changes. On the first two, you got Jones. On the third one, you got Barrett. The next two or three are Jones. Then you got Barrett, Jones, Barrett, Barrett. It just goes back and forth. I know what you're sitting there thinking. Yo, Matt, why is that a big deal? Why are you showing me this? Not just for a person and a quarterback, but for an overall unit of the offense, when you continue to switch quarterbacks here and there every other quarter and every other drive, nobody in that entire offense can get comfortable. Each quarterback throws a different deep ball, one's higher, one's lower, some have more velocity than others, there's many things that are different and hard to get used to if you're a receiver and also a running back. I'm not going to say it didn't make any sense, I do understand what Urban Meyer was trying to do. He understood that he had two really good and more than capable quarterbacks on his team. JT proved in the season before he was good enough to be the starter. Cardell Jones did the exact same thing. As much as I disagree with it, it's not for the fact that I think one should have started over the other, it's more that I think you need to pick one and stick with it. I didn't care who, they were both good. I also remember in 2015 you had people saying that Urban Meyer didn't have big enough balls to hurt one of their feelings. Maybe that was so. Overall, it was a odd predicament. It didn't matter what he did, nothing was going to be the right answer. If he would have started Jones the entire year, people would have said, yo, JT Barrett should be the starter. If he would have started Barrett, it would have been vice versa. Urban Meyer did the best he could in that messy situation. They finished the year 12-1. and The game that cost them was against Michigan State. They lost 17-14. Whoa, 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 hold on. Shall we take a look at that game? I mean, this was the game that cost them the playoffs. In this game they lost, JT Barrett was 9-16 for 16 with a whopping 46 yards. <laughs> Averaging 2.9 on a completion, had one touchdown to zero interceptions with a QBR at 33.5. On the ground, he was the leading rusher with 15 carries. He only had 44 yards though, averaging 2.9 with zero touchdowns. I'm sampling out this game out of every single one of JT Barrett's games for this main reason. This game right here was the turning point for Ohio State fans where they started to question if JT Barrett was good enough to lead them to big time wins. There's nothing to even talk about for this game. I watched it live. JT Barrett, you can just look at the numbers. They don't lie. He was boxed up. He couldn't do anything on the ground or in the air. In that year, his completion percentage was 63.3, decreasing. His passing yards was under 1,000, also decreasing. Had 11 touchdowns to 4 interceptions. On the ground, it was really good. Actually, better than his freshman season. He had 115 carries for 682 yards, averaging 5.9 a pop with 11 TDs. Flash forward in time to 2016, Cardo Jones is out of the picture, and JT Barrett can finally focus on him and just the offense. It was another rather interesting year. I mean, it started out great. JT Barrett, he was the man. Like I spoke on earlier in this video, he put up insane numbers. The problem with that, he did it against terrible and average teams. He never was really good against really good teams. He had his games here and there, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the vast majority. I'm going to single out three games in this season particularly. First things first, we're going to talk about the game against Penn State. They lost 24-21. Going into this game, Ohio State was 6-0. Obviously, they was expected to win. In this game, Trace McSorley, who I feel like is highly overrated. I don't know why anybody gave him praise at all. He was average in my mind. Anyways, he was 8-23 for with a buck 50, one touchdown to zero interceptions. If you're an Ohio State fan and somebody told you Trace McSorley was going to put up those numbers and you'd also hold Saquon Barkley under 100 yards, yards, you would think you'd have won this game by 20 or 30 points. That wasn't the case. On the flip side for Ohio State, JT Barrett was 28 for 43, had 250, one touchdown, zero interceptions with a QBR 61.8. Not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. That's the key statement. 
it wasn't really good either. On the ground, JT had 17 carries for only 26 yards, which is like 1.5 a carry. You got to throw in there two college football. They don't account sacks in there. So it was more like probably 13 to 14 carries for 40 or 50 yards. I personally don't think JT played bad at all in this game. I think he was above average. It doesn't matter if you're not flat out amazing and you lose the game, the quarterback's going to get the blame and he got the blame. Anyways, let's get a move on. After they suffered that loss, they would rally off a couple more wins, then they would match up with Michigan State in a game they won 17 to 16. Yes, this is the game they won. JT Barrett was only 10 for 22 with 86 yards, one touchdown, zero interceptions, QBR 40. He did have 24 carries for 100 yards, but I mean, if you're carrying the ball 24 times, I expect you to get 100 yards. They won this game against a sorry Michigan State team who at the time was 3-7 and seven after they finished 3-8. and eight. JT Barrett in another big game didn't perform that well. We're actually going to focus on four matchups this season, my bad. In the next game against third-ranked Michigan, where a lot of people feel like Michigan, they should have won this game, JT Barrett had another wishy-washy performance. He finished this game 15 for 32 in the air, under 50%. Only at 124 yards with zero touchdowns to one interception. He had a whopping 30 carries for 125 yards with one touchdown. Ohio State somehow pulled this game out, but still, yet again, we see a perfect example. A big time game where JT Barrett isn't playing like a big time player. Following that game, Ohio State would sneak their way into the playoff, matching up against number two Clemson. And yet again, you know what we're going to talk about. You know where this is going. The JT Barrett struggles. He was 19 for 33 with only 120 yards. Dude, this guy only throws dump offs. He would never push the ball down the field. He had zero touchdowns to two interceptions. On the ground, he had 11 carries for negative two yards. I haven't broken down or spoke on his film or how he played too much Ohio State. There's not too much to be said. It was extremely clear he struggled with processing defenses and reading them down the field. Yeah, he was good and he proved he could throw the short passes, the mid ranges, and the check downs. Besides that, he couldn't do anything else. I don't know if he was scared to throw the ball down the field or what it was. Let me put it in a better perspective. JT Barrett wasn't a quarterback that any defense feared. Nobody was on their heels. They knew he wasn't gonna throw it deep down the field. And if he did, it was rare and it was more than likely going to be an inaccurate pass. That right there, maybe that's why he didn't push the ball down the field. He was scared of his arm. He knew he couldn't do it. Was his struggles due to him not being good enough or lack of confidence? I don't know. But all I know is, it doesn't matter now. After Ohio State got completely embarrassed by Clemson, you now had the fan base saying, come on now, do we not have another backup that can do better than this? I'd be feeling the same way. Watching him down the stretch of that season, he can't do good against good teams. It's simple. There's no need to overcomplicate it. He's good against bums. He's trash against good teams. For that entire 2016 season, his completion percentage dropped to 61.5. His yards was only 2,500. He had 24 touchdowns to 7 interceptions. If you noticed, all of his numbers from his freshman year have decreased each season. Even his rushing. From 2016, he had more rushing attempts than his freshman year and still had far less yards. Everybody was thinking relatively the same question. Why in the world was his numbers and the way he played his freshman year so much better than his years after? Well, my friend, it has a lot to do with the same thing we talked about with Cardell Jones. Going into his freshman year, no teams had the scouting report. JT Barrett is a guy I'd like to say, and the first time you play him, it may wow you and shock you. And the second and third time, you know what he's gonna do. It's not that hard to stop. He was getting a ton of criticism going into his senior year. There was heavy expectations. He now had that chip on his shoulder maybe he needed. I guess you could say that chip on his shoulder, it fell rather quickly. And only the second game of the year, they had a terrible loss to Oklahoma. You want to talk about getting showed up. Baker Mayfield went 27 for 35, had 386 yards with three touchdowns. On the flip side, JT Barrett was 19 for 35, only had a buck 80 with zero touchdowns to one interceptions, a QBR of miserable 20.3. Oklahoma ran away with it late. They won 31 to 16. It was also the infamous game where Baker Mayfield planted the flag in the emblem. Following that game, the trend of JT being good against bad teams 
It happened, and they even upset number two Penn State at the time, 39 to 38, before a matchup against Iowa. In this Iowa ball game, Ohio State completely got waxed, and JT Barrett got exposed. He was 18 for 34, had 200 passing yards with three touchdowns with four interceptions. The worst part about this game wasn't that JT played so bad, it was the fact that Iowa blew them out 55 to 24. No disrespect to Iowa, they were not even that good at the time. That was pretty much the end of their season, at least the end of their hopes of getting in the college football playoff. They would win some more games down the stretch, but hey, Ohio State's like Clemson and Alabama and Georgia. If you're not winning the national championship, it's a disappointment. When the season came to an end, JT Barrett had a completion percentage of 64.7, threw for over 3,000 yards, had 35 touchdowns and 9 interceptions. On the ground, he also had 165 carries for 800 yards and 12 touchdowns. You see right there where numbers do lie. His senior year, he had 35 touchdowns in the air and 12 on the ground. Almost 50. That's why his career is so mind-boggling to think about for some people. I've said it before, I'm going to continue to emphasize it in this video. He would look incredible against average and below average teams. Against good and great teams, not so much. Every year, he would lead Ohio State to a 12-1 or an 11-2 record. For Ohio State, that's not good enough. Throughout his entire Buckeye career, his fan base, ESPN analysts, everyone, they question his football ability. Or not his football ability, but his quarterbacking ability. I am going to rave on him and give him some credit. One of the best parts about his game is everyone in the locker room and the coaching staff, they loved him and said he was a great leader. That's awesome to hear. I'm happy for him. I don't care if you're terrible at football and you're not a great quarterback, I'm going to let you know. I'm not going to sugarcoat it because you're a great leader. Same thing can be said for Jalen Hurts. I love Jalen Hurts to death. He's a great and humble dude, a great role model. Is he a good NFL quarterback? No, absolutely not. Not even close. Jalen Hurts is a good football player. He's not a good quarterback. There's a difference. He's an athlete. You can put him in any sport, he's going to be just fine. Also, too, for JT, he won so many awards, I can't even list them all. He is one of the only quarterbacks in the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry to go 4-0 as a starter. That's impressive. He disappointed a lot, and I mean a lot. At least he can say he went 4-0 against Michigan. If you don't want to take my word for it and say I don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. How about you take the word from it from NFL executives? I'll leave you with this and you can do what you want with it. There's a reason he stayed at Ohio State for four years and didn't go to the draft early. He wasn't good enough. It was very evident and clear his questionable quarterback play carried over to the next level. He declared for the 2018 NFL Draft. Unfortunately, he went undrafted. After going undrafted, he participated in the New Orleans Saints rookie minicamp and he signed a three-year deal. He signed this deal on May 3rd in 2018. Why do I say that? Because in September 1st of 2018, he was waived to the practice squad the next day. He spent a lot of times going back and forth from the practice squad and all that good stuff, and eventually he would sign a contract on January 21st in 2019. I think the Saints were just toying with him because in that same year, on August 1st, they waived him. Shortly after being waived by the Saints, nine days later on August 10th in 2019, he signed with the Seattle Seahawks. But, <laughs> I feel bad for this man, only 21 days after signing with the Seahawks, they waived him. What do you know, back into the picture, only 16 days after the Seattle Seahawks waived him, the Saints picked him up again to the practice squad. The main reason they picked him up is because Drew Brees did get hurt, and whenever Drew Brees recovered, they released him on October 22nd. I hope you guys are keeping up with everything. It's a lot happening in a short amount of time. I'm trying to run through this real quick. After he got released by the Saints, the Pittsburgh Steelers picked him up on the practice squad. Finally, some good luck. On December 30th, the Steelers, they signed him to a reserve and future contract. And then, August 2nd, 2020, he was waived. This man's NFL career had to be mentally draining. He got signed, waived, signed, waived, signed, waived so many times in a two-year span. Ever since he got waived in 2020, that's been the end of his NFL career. It was said and speculated he was going to play for this spring league in 2020, some lower professional team, but it got shut down due to the pandemic. He got waived in 2020 from all the NFL teams, and it's about to be 2022. That means it's almost been two full years since he's 
been on an NFL roster. Currently right now, as to when I'm speaking, he's literally jobless. According to his social medias on Twitter and Instagram, he's still working hard at football and he's still practicing, getting ready for his next opportunity. What a career and what a life story for JT Barrett. I know some of you may be wondering, yo Matt, why didn't he get a fair shot and why didn't he get a real opportunity at the next level? I'm not going to sugarcoat this and I'm not going to beat around the bush. The bottom line, he straight up wasn't good enough. Could he run the ball? Yes. But we all know in the NFL, you got to do much more things than run the football. He couldn't process and read defenses. When he was at Ohio State, he proved it. He was fine when he could throw the short passes and check down. But at the next level, you got to push the ball down the field. That's something he couldn't do or bring to the table. Not sure if or when he'll ever get another opportunity. I'm wishing him the best of luck. Let me know what you think about him down below. But with all that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you guys learned something. If you're new to the channel, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Leave a like for more. And as always, let's be great. I'm out, yeah. Peace.